I'm David Goldstein. I'm a professor of genetics at Duke University and uh, soon to be at Columbia University. And I got involved in AHC when uh, several years ago we decided to try to look for the major gene that's responsible for AHC. So the very start for our work in AHC was a recognition that there was a good chance that the mutations responsible for AHC are brand new mutations in the individuals that have AHC. And in fact, in that situation, it was difficult to track down the gene before we could sequence genomes if individuals that had the disease um, were very seriously affected. And the reason it was difficult then is that you didn't get big families with lots of people with disease. And so the old approach to finding disease genes of using what we call linkage, which is basically looking at parts of the genome that are inherited together with disease in big families, you couldn't do that. So instead, what you can do once you can sequence um, entire genomes is look through a patient's entire genome, find the new mutations, and see if any of them cause disease. So we recognized that'd be possible for AHC, and we decided to try to do it. Well, the, the first, um, I guess, point to make about discovering a gene for a disease is that that really is only the starting point. And, and in fact, in, in many ways, it's the easiest part of it. Um, so when we found the gene and when we realized through a very um, extensive collaboration that it was um, the important gene and that in fact the vast majority of patients had disease because of mutation in this gene, we were really excited because that, that clearly does give a direction for a treatment. It gives a direction. So that was really important. So the early work was incredibly exciting and I think we all really felt like this really was transformational because before that you didn't know where to begin. You had no idea where to begin in terms of setting a direction for a treatment. So that was an incredibly exciting start and really one of the most satisfying discoveries, um, genetic discoveries of my career and I think for the group because this is um, such a serious um, disease and not well treated at all. And like I said, before the genetics, no direction to take. So the discovery of the gene and the fact that it was responsible for most cases was of true importance. Um, that said, the gene discovery itself doesn't tell you how to treat the disease. In order to use the gene discovery to learn how to better treat the disease, we need to understand exactly what these mutations do and find a way to compensate or undo the effects of these mutations. And that process is really only just beginning. And, um, and so what I would say is that the work so far has been characterized by incredible excitement, um, a sense of opportunity early on, and now we're in a phase where um, we need to figure out how to do this work, and most importantly, we need to figure out how to do a lot more of the work than we're doing right now, and that requires substantial research funding. And right now there isn't that much research funding going in specifically to figuring out how to use the genetic discoveries um, to develop new therapies. I should emphasize that HC is not unique in this. We're in this situation for lots and lots of diseases where we're making good genetic progress, but we are having difficulty transla translating that into new therapies. That's where we need to concentrate. The, the two things that we fundamentally need to do are, number one, we need to know exactly what these mutations do. And we actually still don't know that. And that actually is pretty incredible if you think about it. Um, we know that they compromise the function. Um, the, the gene um, that these mutations are in um, encodes a, a kind of transporter that moves things across um, cells, membranes. And we know that the function is compromised. But we don't know exactly how it's compromised. And we don't know whether the mutations do anything new in addition to compromising function. We have to work it out. We have to figure out exactly what these mutations do. We have to figure out how the mutations that cause different diseases cause those different diseases, because so they don't all do the same thing. So that's one fundamental thing that we need to work out. The other fundamental thing we need to do is figure out a way to develop what we refer to as screening programs, where we can set up some kind of a model of the disease, either an animal model or a model actually on the lab bench, and use that model to test out drugs to see if they have efficacy in the model. Then once we can find drugs that have efficacy in the model, 
we can move them into patients. These are the two fundamental things that we need to do. Both of those things are really difficult to do, and we don't know exactly how to do them right. So we need lots of groups exploring a variety of different directions to figure out how to get at the basic biology of the mutations and to develop these screening programs so that we can test out new treatments. I am personally, let me just say this, I am personally optimistic that we are going to make a difference in the treatment of AHC because we know the gene. I think that is eventually going to happen. And in fact, I have very high confidence in that. I think that it is likely to take a long time. But fundamentally, there is no reason at all that we can't do it. Absolutely no reason. Um, we do very little therapeutically right now. And so, in fact, um, there's a lot of room for even modest improvements. And we haven't had a way before to systematically screen for potential new therapies. Now we do, because we can set up these models. So yes, I am absolutely optimistic we are going to ultimately make a difference. But if we look at the experience from other genetic diseases, it often takes a long time from a genetic discovery to a new treatment based on that genetic discovery. Um, some classic examples can take as many as 20 years. So I think we have to be realistic that it's not necessarily going to be fast. But I think that we should be optimistic that it will happen. Uh, Dr. Uh, Muhammad Makati, who was a partner in our genetic work right from the beginning, uh, he has established a comprehensive AHC clinic. And there's a couple of really important things about having a comprehensive AHC clinic. One important thing is that all of the clinical areas of expertise that you need are available so that you can provide really comprehensive care um, to patients. And I'm myself not clinical, um, but it's clear that there are many different manifestations of AHC and you really need um, diverse areas of expertise clinically in order to provide good care for patients. So that's one of the things that this comprehensive clinic does. It just provides good care. And in order to provide good care, you need more than one clinical specialization. That's really important, and everything that I've heard is that it works really, really well that way, and that comprehensive care is important. The other reason that the, the clinic is so important is that as we do the functional work to try to understand the mutations and how to find compounds that undo the effects of the mutations, we have to bring those candidate treatments to patients. And when we bring those candidate treatments to patients, we have to know exactly what the effects of the treatments are on those patients, which means we have to have a clinical context in which we can collect very com comprehensive information about the patients to see if the treatments are helping. So this kind of a comprehensive clinic provides us exactly the setting for that kind of translational work of being able to move those new um, therapeutic opportunities into patients. One of the things that I find really most gratifying about working in AHC is, is the role of families and family organizations. It, they have been incredibly effective spokespeople for research on AHC. And there are two really important functions um, in particular that the family organizations um, provide. One is they keep the researchers working well together. It actually is an unfortunate truth that, like in any area of work in research, there's a lot of competitiveness, and that is sometimes counterproductive. So people want the credit themselves, <clears throat> they want the discoveries themselves, and sometimes that can be a disincentive to sharing information and working together, and that can cause the work to go more slowly. Family organizations in the HC have been incredibly effective at reminding researchers that there is actually a larger goal here that we should all keep in mind. It's easy for all of us to forget about larger goals. Family organizations remind us of that. And that is really important. And I can say that has absolutely changed the way HC research is done. It would not have been done as well without the role of those family organizations. So they provide that function and I think do an absolutely incredible job. The other thing they do is help make the case that we need to do more research in AHC. And that's really important. There is a fierce competition for um, research dollars in, in, in the world. And it is the case that the more 
investment we make in developing these screening programs that I refer to and studying the basic biology. The more investment we make, the sooner we're going to actually make a difference therapeutically. And so that case has to be made, that there is urgency, that, that these patients need new treatments, and the family organizations do a really good job, I think, of, of making that case. What we're doing ourselves in the group, the direction that we are taking to try to develop a, an experimental model that we can use to screen new potential therapies, what we're doing is using a mouse model and then setting up lab bench neuronal networks from the mouse model so that we can actually test out to see how compounds behave in this benchtop neuronal network. And if this benchtop neuronal network can capture some effect of the mutation, then we can test out new treatments in this laboratory bench setting. And in this context, um, there's really two types of approaches we can take. One is we can try to act directly on the mutant protein. And there actually are some compounds around that we know bind the mutant protein, since this mutant protein is deformed in some way from, by the mutation, if we can find a compound that pushes it back towards the shape it ought to have, maybe that will help. So one direction we're taking is that we're working with a set of compounds that are known to bind, and we're doing that in collaboration with a, a group from Denmark. And we're going to test these things out. The other direction is really just open-ended to throw everything we can find in these experimental models and see if we get lucky to find some compound that compensates indirectly for the effects of the mutation. So those are the two ways that we're going about it. So we have uh, been working um, extensively um, with uh, Arne von Magdenberg um, in an effort to find um, a, a second HC gene. Uh, that hasn't actually uh, succeeded so far, and in fact, we are not absolutely certain that there is a second AHC gene um, to find, but we have been working uh, uh, with that group to, to look for one. Um, and we're also working with the uh, group um, of Paul Neeson uh, in Denmark uh, in a variety of different ways, um, but in particular, um, using compounds that they've identified um, that bind to the protein that the ATP183 gene uh, encodes to see if they have any activity in the experimental models um, that, uh, that we are setting up. Uh, uh, Paul has also put together a, a group of people to apply for European Union support um, to do uh, a lot of basic research on the biology of, of the gene and also to develop new screening programs, and we're involved in that as well.